Hi, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. So I also changed my title in the meantime of uh, presentation. What I'm here to talk about today is uh, complexity, and it's generally complexity in web development. So first, let me introduce myself, and at the time it's just to reiterate, I'm Fabrizio Fortunato, lead front-end developer at Reiner Labs. And this is my Twitter and GitHub handle, and also you can find my blog where I generally speak about web development. So let's start. Sing to me of the man muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time, and again, of course, once he had plundered the hollow heights of Troy. This is how Homer starts his odyssey, and this is how I want to start our odyssey, our journey through complexity. So start by the meaning of the word complexity. Complexity means the state or quality of being uh, intricate or complicated. It, comes, it derives from Latin, com complexus, and if we look at the usage over time, this is uh, by Google, what you can see is that in the 1950s, the, the word started, being like, started really uh, being overused. And I don't know if it is a coincidence, but in 1954, the first programming language was released, Fortran. So I do believe it's developer faults, actually, of this overuse of the word complexity. So the first driver of uh, complexity in web development is business logic. Business logic is that part of the program which encodes real business rules. It dictates how business object interacts with one another. So we can represent it generally through a flowchart. So in this case, I want to search for the flights. I'm going to input my dates. If there are flights available, I'll display the flights. Otherwise, I'll suggest different dates. And this is, this is a simple business logic to the, that we can encode. So now, after the introduction, we are ready to, uh, to go through our journey, the first step of our journey. And uh, we start off with the history of complexity, because I believe it is important to know our past in order to understand the present and predict the future. Web development started in 1991. That's when the first website came along. Now, around, during, uh, through that decade, for, so from 91 to 2000, the average page size was uh, 14 kilobytes. We weren't talking about that much about complexity. The only thing that we had was dancing baby GIF, and uh, like that, that was web development during that time. In the next decade, from 2000 to 2010, what was marked was uh, the release, for example, of CSS2. We started paying more attention to UX, and by this I mean uh, generally uh, designing glossy buttons. That's what we were doing. And so the, the average web page went from 14 kilobytes to 100 kilobytes. In the next decade, so the current decade, from 2010 till now, what was marked this decade for, was for the um, release, the coming of new modern JavaScript frameworks. Backbone at first, then AngularJS. Also HTML5 came along during this decade. The Renner website also went through different transformation, three, three actual websites uh, during this time. And this is because all these uh, changes were fueled by an increase of complexity in web development, and we needed some tools to actually handle this complexity. But this didn't reflect well with performance. So what we started was in 2010, a uh, web page, an average web page was around 470 kilobytes till we arrive as per today, where an average web page is 1.5 megabytes. Now, I know I'm kind of correlating complexity with average page size, which is not entirely true, but for web application, it is, a, it is actually a good metric to, lo to look at it. And uh, just to, I want to stress out why this is important, like uh, page, page size, because uh, let, let's take an experiment. This one, you can find it in Google, if you Google Impact Calculator. So let's say that our website loads in three seconds, and we have an average of one million users with an order average of $150, with a conversion of 2%. If we manage to decrease our speed, our, um, our page load, uh, increase our speed, so decrease the page load time by one second, this is the potential revenue that we are looking at, 1.3 million. And this is not just some kind of game. Amazon reported this, 
um, that if they will slow down their website by one second, they will lose around, roughly around 1.6 billion per year. So that's, that's why it is important. So in a, during this talk, what I'm going to talk about is uh, different areas of complexity in web development and how we can try to reduce this kind of complexity. We start off with services complexity, so the interaction between front-end and back-end. Historically, like, complexity was only part of the back-end. Back-end was the monster, and front-end was just, the responsibility was just the displaying things or making glossy buttons, right? Then uh, the communication was very simple, one-to-one. -one. So th this kind of, kind of back-end is what we refer to as uh, the monolith. Now, I know this is not the kind of odyssey that I was speaking about, but uh, I really need to put it there. And um, so uh, the monolithic uh, architecture when, um, started to be, let's say, destroyed or shifted into microservices back in 2011, it started. So what it means is that the, uh, the backend started using a collection of different services, loosely coupled and independent deployable. Our application became a collection, a suite of different uh, services. But if we can rephrase the law of conservation of energy, complexity cannot be destroyed. It can only be changed from one form to another. So what it meant is that now the aggregation or the communication between all these microservices was done in the front end. In our case, we'll have to, for example, deal with flights, accommodation, and car hire. And we can also see this, uh, like if we look at the average total number of requests over time, we can see that it increased uh, also over time. What we are trying to experiment, what we're experimenting with this in order to reduce this complexity is uh, the concept of backend for front end. So, Basically, it's putting back the aggregation where it was supposed to be. And what we gain by using this concept is that we are reducing complexity in the front end because we are shifting it back to the back end. And remember, complexity on the front end, the, the one who pays it is your users. We, are, we can unify data models between uh, the different microservices. And also, if you have different clients, you can reuse this business logic. You can reuse these services across your, for example, Android application or iOS application. A perfect match for this one is GraphQL. GraphQL is a query language for your API. And what it does, it models your business domain as a graph. You define a schema. And it uses a very powerful declarative data fetching so the client directly specify what is necessary uh, for, uh, for, for him. Let's have a look at uh, our uh, basket, uh, basket services. This is still uh, uh, what we are developing now on, uh, on GraphQL. So this is an example of the schema. We have a basket with some total, the items inside the basket, we call it components. And uh, the total, for example, has an amount, a currency, and if it includes taxes. So let's have a look how we can, we can use GraphQL. So what we can do is, uh, what we define in, uh, in uh, GraphQL is queries. In this case, I want to get my basket, and I'm only interested if you see on the total. I don't care about, uh, we wanted to display only our total in here, in our queries. In another example, in this case, instead we want to also display our, uh, our items inside. So what we do is we just append it to us. To the similar query, just we append, we want also the, uh, uh, our items, our components in our basket. So this is the, this is the power of uh, declarative data fetching. You always specify exactly what you need. There's no over or under fetching. Now, we were discussing about the backend shifted into microservices, but what about the frontend? Well, the front end, oh, by nature, it's, um, uh, it's generally a monolith, and that's mainly for performance reasons. The other thing is that different frameworks, they don't talk very well to each other, like React, Angular, Vue, they don't really work together that, that well. What, it, what, what this led is a high exposure to technical depth. 
similar to what the backend was experiencing uh, before shifting into microservices. So to give you an example of this, uh, this is the Rainer website is a single page application built in AngularJS. And we are talking about more than 300,000 lines of code. There's only the front end with 75 routes, which translate roughly in 75 pages. And we're not talking about content pages. These are heavy application with heavy business logic pages. So what we realize is that scaling up, scaling up teams and software is art. When you have more than 10 distributed team around working on the same code base, this is art. Since there is no clear division between the teams, everyone is responsible. So in the end, no one is responsible for actually those changes. So to sum it up, we can't, we can't write software fast enough with a monolith. So what's left for us is to break down the monolith. Oh no, not the same effect. No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so what we, where, where we can start? Let's look at our pages, an example. So we have our own page, our Flux Select page, and our products page. And what we can do is split them up in different applications. So each page is its own application. This is what I call micro pages. In, uh, in, uh, in this sense, what, what, is a, what is a micro page is uh, an, independent, uh, an independent page that can be developed and deployed independently. Is, uh, they are loosely coupled, so they only know what is next, what is the next page, and what was probably the previous page. The, although, even if they're loosely coupled, it doesn't mean that we are inventing the wheel over and over in the pages. So we are using a, a set of shared components that we can use across the pages. So this is basically all the characteristic that the microservices have applied to the front end. And it also gives you, an, uh, uh, in a way, to break down your monolith iteratively. You don't need to release all the pages at once. You can take page by page and start introducing these micro pages. So it's basically the concept of a single page application per page, which I know it feels you are underusing the power of a single page applications, but this is necessary in order to reduce your surface of exposure to technical depth. So next one is design complexity. Over the course of the years, what we look at different designs that came along, different approach to design. So we start off five years ago with responsive web design based upon the concept of fluid grids or media queries for hiding, showing content, and also flexible images. What, we, what was responsive web design basically is we designed it for desktop and then we also scaled down to mobile. When we realized that uh, the mobile traffic started increasing, and that scaling down was difficult, we reverse this approach. We, put, we started using mobile first. This is an example in rooms.trainer.com. That's, that's what we use. But this wasn't actually uh, good enough for us. And that's because this way, we basically double our complexity. We had two completely different interactions, two completely sometimes also designs between mobile and between desktop. So that's why we started using an adaptive uh, solution. What does it mean is that we develop only for mobile and only for desktop. What it gives us is two independent flows, two different applications, which are very performance-oriented uh, for, uh, for that specific uh, 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 device. OK, so in the next step, our last step, actually, through complexity, is uh, infrastructure complexity. Now, uh, every, I know that when speaking about front-end, you're generally not involved, and you're not responsible for the infrastructure. But I do believe that it is, uh, our code is running somewhere, and we need to know how this code is running. So what we will look in here is how we can decrease complexity in our infrastructure also. Let me introduce you to serverless. Serverless, we define as serverless any application or services that relies on third-party services, like, for example, S3 for uh, object storage or Google Cloud Functions for running your code in the cloud. Why serverless is, uh, uh, is very good in our case? Because 
you know, not only we are reducing complexity in our teams, but we are also offloading the blame to someone else. And moreover, as I was speaking, a front-end developer shouldn't be responsible for actually looking after server. Should be responsible for caring about your user interfaces or writing user interfaces. This is an example of all the topics that a front-end developer needs to know during a normal day of development. And I want to be servers to be on that list also. Example of how we use uh, serverless in, uh, in Rainer. It's, uh, for example, for hosting our solution. We, have, we, we use S3 to store our files. And then uh, CloudFront, which is Amazon CDN, to serve this. And uh, what is our responsibility? Just to upload the file, like you would be doing for an FTP. And then Amazon takes care of the rest, scaling up and everything. Another example is uh, for Lambda functions, so for function in the cloud in this case, is Brotley compression. Brotley is generally um, a better algorithm, compression algorithm for, uh, for the web. So generally performs better than gzip. This is the list of uh, the browser that supports it now, the, the usual offender all always there. And uh, so we need a way to actually uh, support this fallback. Can I ask you a question? Raise your hand. How many of you, you use this Brotoli in production? No one? Couple of people? OK. What if I show you how actually easy, easy it is with serverless to start using Brotoli? So it's just a few lines of code in here. We are intercepting the request. We are checking the headers. And if the browser supports Brotoli, we serve the Brotoli compressed file. Otherwise, we fall back to JZ. Why this is important, why this means a lot to us, because just by doing this with a few lines of code, we are reducing our footprint, the application footprint by 23%. So to sum it up, all of, all of these practices, all, all this journey through complexity, what I want to present you today is what we call Ryanair 3.0. And it, we actually just released it last week, just in time for UX to UX, I would say. And, uh, so this is our first uh, step. This is our first page towards the micro pages uh, architecture. We started with the flight select. So what it means, uh, uh, Rainer 3.0, is an adaptive solution. It's going to use the micro pages approach and also leverage a lot serverless. What, what we started doing, especially in Rainer 3.0, is paying special attention to performance. Which, it, which translated into going from a 2.2 megabyte of the current solution to actually 572 kilobytes. And this translates into a first meaningful pain going from around 15 seconds to actually 6 seconds. Other metrics that we are looking at was, uh, is uh, the, the current flex select with an online uh, mode on a synthetic uh, metric takes around 10 seconds, while the new flight select takes around 1.5 seconds. And OK. So as I was promise you, I wanted to make, we want to make our user happy again, and this is our first step. But I do believe that we are still far away from Ithaca. And that's because reducing complexity in web development is a never-ending journey. So I want to leave you with the outcome razor. Entity are not to be multiplied beyond necessity. So, Keep it simple. Thank you so much, Fabrizio. I mean, Rhino must have an awful lot of technical debt. <laughs> but it sounds like you're managing it in a really incredible yeah, way. Yeah, there's loads of work actually going, and loads of people actually handling all of these since now. It's very a collective effort. Yeah. So we do have some time for some questions. We have a mic that is ready to be passed around. Please put your hand up if you have some questions. We have one here in the front. Hi, Fabrizio. Thanks. That was really interesting. Um, two, two questions, a big really. Um, what way are your teams set up? Are your UI people in cross-functional teams? And the other one is, w would these um, pretty drastic changes be applicable to every company, or just because you have such scale of users, you've made some huge, huge decisions there. Would you, would you recommend that to everybody, or is it just because you have so many users? 
Okay, so let's start with the teams. Uh, like generally, we have uh, it's more uh, heterogeneous teams. So you will have front-end developers, back-end developers, and, and all the different figures on, on the team. And um, so the, we believe that the team should be autonomous uh, and making a, and it can take um, a feature from development to production. These um, uh, these things, these uh, these things that we use, these tips, these steps through complexity. I think part of it, like you can definitely like we can recommend to start using Broadly, for example, or um, another case would be GraphQL for uh, for uh, handling your aggregation. But uh, other things like adaptive, or uh, uh, if I can think of uh, the macro pages approach, these are specific for our use cases. So the adaptive, it's like you need it. Will, in the end, you're gonna say that you're gonna uh, handle two applications. So it brings you a different kind of complexity that you have to manage in there. While uh, uh, the other one, the macro pages, it was mainly for, we wanted a way, iterative way to break down a monolith. And uh, this is what we, we came up with. Excellent, thank you. Any more questions? One in the back there. Hi, uh, you said you support your micro pages with a set of shared components. How do you manage those shared components um, so that the, the, the complexity isn't transferred into them and, and they're, they're, they're kept easy, easy to use and don't become specific to something? Yeah, th this is something that we always debate between, between the teams. And uh, so w starting off, it's visibility. So everything needs to have visibility of these components in order to understand how they work. And uh, so creating all the tooling around actually to manage those components is important. So to release them, uh, to publish them, uh, etc. After that, like the, uh, how we keep it simple is generally we don't start from the generic, but we start from the specific. So one of the, for example, one of the micro, if we take one of the micro pages that, that I was showing, it, it's in there inside the micro page that we develop. Uh, one of the common components, and then when we see that another page needs it or another flow needs it, then we we try to extract it. So it's it's kind of like instead of going from the general, uh, uh, starting from the general, we start from the specific and then go to the general. Thank you. Any more questions? There's one. Oh, you got one. How's it going? Um, I was wondering if by taking a micro pages approach that you could possibly incur a higher performance penalty from pulling down a payload, a large payload for every single app, for every page? And if so, and if you did experience that, did that sway your choice of framework to something that was a much smaller bundle size as a result? And, or how did, you, how did you approach that? Okay, so uh, first thing is yes, we, we, we actually consider that there's gonna be, there is a hard refresh between the pages. So we'll have to deal with it. And what we're looking at is, for example, start intensively using server-side rendering. That's, that's one thing that uh, hopefully, don't make any promise, but maybe by the end of the year, we're going to have a, a something for it. And um, be, besides that, yes, like, but the, what we reasoned was, the, the reason was the following. It's easier to actually split our application and then trying to put it back together rather than starting another time from uh, a monolith uh, um, uh, approach. Great, thank you. Still a question down the front here. So you talked about serverless technology and the fact that development should need to care about the, the, the server hosting of their application. Um, I guess there has been traditionally a different train of thought where developers need to know and be part of the DevOps team and have DevOps members within teams because sometimes there are issues that you only see in production or production-like environments that can be very difficult to find or debug uh, otherwise. Mm -hmm. Is that, and do you have a similar experience or now that you've moved to serverless, how, how do you debug in production when you don't have those environments or look after those things locally? Yeah, this is something that we started mainly a year, a year and a half ago. We started all roughly two years, introducing DevOps also in our teams. So letting the teams take more responsibility into this rather than throwing the ball to another team, to the infrastructure team. And um, what it came out with was that a lot of the front-end developers, that they wouldn't have the necessary knowledge or skills to 
actually look after scaling services or uh, writing configuration for your Linux machines, etc. So that's why we, 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 what we worked on is to try to find out what is the simplest uh, approach that we can take to put our things uh, uh, out in production. So that's why the decision about uh, serverless. And uh, regarding the environments, like using, we use AWS a lot. Uh, probably seen it in the example. And it's very easy to replicate like production, uh, production like environment across uh, across different your accounts. Thank you. Any more questions from the floor? Oh, you spotted one. Um, I was wondering about your policy to design just for mobile and desktop. Um, we did the same recently, prioritizing those two um, viewports. But then when it came to testing, the tablet design wasn't acceptable, which meant the tasks had to go back into the team to, to be reworked, which caused frustration all around. Have you experienced the same, and how did you address that? Something similar, not actually the same, because uh, generally tablet traffic is not that significant to actually justify uh, a solution only for tablet. So that's why uh, we are still debating if using the desktop or the tablet uh, version for, uh, for, uh, for the tablet in this case. But generally, uh, tablet, t tablet, uh, tablet traffic is not that significant that we are looking to create a tablet-specific version. Thank you. Excellent. I think that's all the time we've got for questions now, but if you all give Fabrizio a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.